So I made this basketball hoop and it's super cool. Check it out. If you miss with this backboard, then you really suck. So a few weeks ago, I built this backboard that would direct tons of shots into the hoop. It was fun, but I came out of it a little bit dissatisfied. There's physical limits to how many shots it can direct in. In particular, it has problems with line drives. I just couldn't let that stand. So at the risk of embroiling myself in a never-ending game of self one upmanship I decided to build a V2. And the goal is to fix as many of its shortcomings as possible. So it turns out great. Not only does it sync shots, it knows all about your shot. It knows where it came from, so you could potentially do some cool training things like know if you're shooting consistently. Thanks to facial recognition, it also knows who is shooting. This makes it really easy to just completely wreck my wife. Well, you are really good at basketball. Well, you really suck at basketball. So this is a neat thing, but what is going on here and how does it know? So the, the basic gist is that the backboard is tracking everything that's going on in the room. It figures out if a ball is coming at it and what trajectory it's on. And then it uses that information to figure out how it needs to move the backboard so that it'll direct the ball into the hoop. So it works pretty darn well. Definitely not perfect, but pretty good. The biggest issues right now are windows being laggy. Sometimes windows will just randomly stall and it'll send the command to the microcontroller late. It makes it look like the stupidest backboard alive rather than the smartest one. So underneath this system is layers and layers of linear algebra that I wrote to track the ball, to figure out where it's going to hit, to do the motion, and there's so much room for bugs. I fixed a lot of them, but it still occasionally just does totally the wrong thing. And I haven't gotten to the bottom of all of them. Oh, and before I forget, I am not the first guy to try to build a system like this. I sort of assume the whole internet has seen Mark Rober's dartboard. If you haven't, it's pretty cool. You should check it out. But basically what it does is it tracks a dart when you throw it, and it moves a dartboard so you get a bullseye. It's pretty cool. It's very similar to this. So think of me like Chick-fil-A. I didn't invent the chicken, but I did invent the chicken sandwich, if you know what I mean. So getting this whole system working was not easy. And the reason for that is, just like all of us, its biggest enemy is time itself. There's only about 600 milliseconds from when I throw the ball to when it strikes the backboard. And in that time, I have to figure out where's the ball, what trajectory is it following, and then I have to move the backboard to whatever position I need to so that it'll direct the ball in. Well, let, me, let me show you 600 milliseconds. That was 600 milliseconds. Let me do it again. Not very long to do all that in. Doing those two things in that period of time is what drove basically all of the software and mechanical design of this project. All right, let's dive in and I'll show you how I did it. So what in the world is going on with all this mechanical design? So this, this backboard is optimized for doing two things. The first is moving the backboard to a, as wide of a range of positions as possible and then doing it as absolutely quickly as it can. So there's three big motors in it, and each one controls an arm. And you might be wondering, why is there only three motors, not four? And it's really just because I only need three. You, you may remember from geometry class that it only takes three points in space to define a plane. And that's what these motors are doing. Each one is moving these push rods up and down, and it defines where this point is in space. And that allows me to fully define where this plane is. Because I have three motors, I have three degrees of freedom. I can move it in and out, I can tilt it left and right, and I can nod it up and down. Because these joints are only defining the rotation and the in and out position, if I just had these linkages in the corner, the whole hoop would be free to flop around. I don't want it to just flop around like a dead fish, I want it to move in a defined way. So I need to lock it in so that it doesn't move laterally or rotate. And that's why I have this rail here. So this rail is a nice, smooth, precision rail, and it keeps the, the hoop from moving left to right, in and out, and then rotating about Z. And then on the end of it, there's just this universal joint that I made. This is 3D printed, and there's skate bearings in here, which make it really nice. So another big reason why this is designed the way that it is, is that I needed the thing that I was moving, AKA the backboard, to be as absolutely light as possible. So I'm, I'm talking about high school a lot here, but do you remember physics class, force is equal to mass times acceleration, F equals MA? In order to get this thing into position fast enough to direct the ball in, I have to accelerate it super fast. Since force is mass times acceleration, if the mass is high and the acceleration is high, the force is gonna be really high. I was barely able to make this work even with these huge motors. And so I needed to reduce the mass that I'm moving as much as possible. So by having the motors stationary 
in this light structure up here, I'm moving the minimal amount of things. This is why this stiffening structure is cored out so much. It isn't just so that it looks awesome, although it looks kind of cool, I think. It was actually to make it as absolutely light as I could. So, so think of this as a racing horse. I want the horse to be as absolutely powerful as possible, then I want as thin and emaciated and light of a jockey on top as possible. When you do those things, you get maximum speed. Oh, and all that talk about horses reminds me, I'm putting about, I think, a fifth of a horsepower into this piece of plastic to move it where I need it to go. That may or may not sound like a lot, but it's a lot. And even then, it's barely enough. I would spent a lot of time up front doing calculations and hand-wringing about which motors and what kind of gearing I needed. And I thought I was mostly safe, but it's barely enough. And in fact, if you throw a ball at it super hard, you can make the motors skip. But don't worry, I've, I've already ordered even bigger and even better motors. They're gonna fix this problem. They should be in next week. So as you can see, most of the structure is made of sheet metal. It's all plasma cut, which means basically cutting the material out with electricity, which is way cooler actually in real life than it even sounds. And I also use this fancy tool that I made a while back, which allows me to draw all the bends on the sheet metal before I cut it. That way I can bend it after the fact really accurately and quickly. And then once everything is cut out, it's all just spot welded together. This is a super powerful technique that's fast and cheap. I think it took me about two hours start to finish to plasma cut, fold, and spot weld this all together. And it cost like $5 in sheet metal. There's also some pretty cool 3D printed parts. I made the ball joints from scratch because I just couldn't find something good enough on the timeline that I needed. I also machined the balls out of ball bearings, which was a huge pain because the metal is super hard. And I would definitely put machining hardened steel balls in my not fun list, but you gotta do what you gotta do. The arms are actually a composite structure. The bottom of the arm is 3D printed. It has a built-in pulley for the belts to interface with. So the, the basic strategy I'm using here is all the parts that are hard to make, I 3D print if I can. If I can't, then I machine them like the balls and then everything else is plasma cut and spot welded sheet metal. Electrically, there's really not that much going on. I have off the shelf stepper drivers driving the motors and then I have an Arduino. So I think the only real interesting thing about the electronics is that the microcontroller is actually my speed limit right now. I'm using literally all of the processor cycles to command the moves to the motors. If the processor could run faster, it could send them commands faster. So the one other piece of electronics that I'm using is a Kinect. It's a thing made by Microsoft for the Xbox. And what it does is it gives you a video feed. And then for all of the pixels in the video feed, it tells you how far they are from the camera. And I'm using that to do the ball trajectory tracking and planning for knowing where things are gonna hit and all of that. All right, let's talk about the software. This is the bits, the bytes, the ones, the zeros, you know, all the nerd stuff. And as is kind of customary for me, I grossly underestimated how hard the software was gonna be. The, the vast majority of the work for this project was the software. I spent way more time on this than anything else. The mechanical design was super easy compared to the software. Going into this, I was saying, well, I'm using a Kinect and it has all this depth information, so how hard could it be to pick out the ball? Turns out it's pretty hard when your stupid head looks exactly like a basketball, at least according to the computer. So the main software challenges were how do I find the ball and how do I do that fast and accurately? And these algorithms that you use to find the ball are pretty slow, so doing it in real time, remember you only have a few hundred milliseconds, is challenging. And then all of the math involved with the trajectory mapping and movements, that also was pretty difficult to get right. Okay, so the Kinect gives me a video feed of what's happening. And remember, a video feed is just a series of images. So imagine that this is one of the frames that just came in. And in this frame, there's some crap on the ground, me, and the ball. I don't know what's wrong with me. Thanks to computer vision, I identify these three things as potential balls. You might be wondering why this pile of crap might be identified as a ball. It just comes down to the statistics that are done for computer vision. It's more of an art than a science. And th there's sometimes noise in the image. The ball isn't a perfect thing. It's sometimes blobby looking too. And so you have to have wiggle room in your statistics to capture the ball when it's not perfectly captured, which means you also capture things that are not balls at all. And this is the main challenge of, of what I had to do is how do I sort through this information and figure out what is actually the ball and if it's coming at the hoop? So I have this frame and I don't know which things are actually the ball, if any. And then time goes on and I get another frame from the Kinect. Let's just assume that the ball is on some trajectory like this through the image. And I'm drawing the 2D case because it's a whole lot harder to draw the 3D case, but the same logic applies in 3D. So what I do is I take all of the possible balls that I found in this frame 
and I connect them to balls in the previous frames that within the rules of physics could plausibly have been that ball at a previous time. So this possible ball couldn't be this possible ball because in order to go from here to there in one frame, it would be going like 2000 miles per hour, which I know nothing is, nothing is doing that in my shop. What you end up with is this ball could be this ball, this ball could be this ball, and this ball could be this ball. So if I let a little bit more time pass, there's a, there's a tricky thing that happens. As the ball follows its trajectory to wherever it's going, it gets really close to my head. And if I apply the rules of physics, my head could have gone here. So it could be the ball at this point. And my ball could have gone to where my head is. So I end up with all of these splits in the possibilities of which of these are the balls, which is actually okay. I'll explain why. And then my pile of trash is the same. So we'll do one more frame. So the ball then continues on over here on its trajectory to wherever it's going. And I make my connections as always. So if you look at all these connections I just made, each path going through it backwards in time is a potential series of ball positions that represent the movement of the ball. In this case, the actual ball is this, this path through all these connections. Also, if you're curious, this structure that I made of all these connections, it's called, a, in computer science, it's referred to as a graph. You may have heard of graph theory and wondered what that was. Graph theory is all about dealing with these types of structures and figuring stuff out from them. But back to the problem, I, I start to amass all these possible things that were balls. And what I then do is for every possible path through the structure that might be a ball, I fit a ballistic trajectory to it. So if we look at this wrong path here where it's the ball, which moves over a little bit, which jumps over to my head, which jumps back to the ball. If I fit a ballistic trajectory to this, it's not going to fit very well. This isn't a, this isn't a ballistic trajectory. If I take that path and plot it, it might look something like this. This isn't a very good ballistic trajectory. And then say I plot my head's trajectory across time, it might look something like this, because it's not moving. So that's not a very good ballistic trajectory. And then the actual ball trajectory will look like this. I can figure out which one is actually the ball because a ballistic trajectory fits it well. This is how I filter out the ball from all the things that aren't the ball. My head is never gonna be following a ballistic trajectory. <laughs> I hope not at least, right? This works really, really well. Okay, I've done what I was doing before and I've found a ballistic trajectory that I think is the ball. The next step, I project out to where I think it's going based on this ballistic trajectory and where on the hoop it would hit. I also know how much time there is between where I am now and when it's going to strike the hoop. And the more data I can collect, the better my estimate is. If I only have a few points, there's a range of trajectories that it might follow. And as I collect more and more points, the possibilities of where it could go narrows down significantly. So what I wanna do is wait until the absolute last possible minute to tell the hoop to move to whatever position it needs to do to make the ball go in. And I know how long it takes to move. So what I do is I just collect data until the absolute last millisecond. And then I say hoop move, and then it goes and moves to wherever it needs to move. The one final piece of the puzzle is how do I calculate what angle I should move the backboard to so that it will go in. So the thing that makes this kind of hard is that I have a robot that can move the backboard in and out and to all these different angles. And it turns out that there's infinitely many solutions that will cause the ball to go in. So let's look at our side view again. So as the ball comes in on this trajectory, so remember I can move the hoop in and out. So if I move the hoop out to meet the ball earlier, I might need to direct it like this to bounce the ball down, which is different than if I move the hoop backwards. I might need to angle it like this so that I bounce the ball up and into the hoop. So there's this continuum of possible poses that the backboard could be in. One other funny thing is that there's, there's also usually a couple of solutions. So say I moved the hoop out like this to get to the ball earlier, I can direct the ball down like I already drew, or I can direct the ball up and it'll fly up and then come back down into the hoop, which is pretty funny. The reason that there's two possible trajectories is that ballistic trajectories are quadratic equations. So you might remember back in high school having to solve quadratic equations and hating your life because this is stupid. The reason there's two trajectories is due to this plus and minus. When you solve a quadratic equation, there's often two solutions. Basically, when you solve the ballistic trajectories, there's a plus and a minus, and that represents the two different trajectories that it can take. Okay, here's what I do, is I look at this incoming trajectory, and I solve for the angles that I would need the backboard to be at if I move it to those positions so that the ball will go in. I do it at one millimeter increments, and I end up with a really big set of these. And some of these I can't do. Like this one I probably can't do because I don't have enough range of motion with my robot. Maybe I can do this one, 
but it's less optimal because I have to move further, which takes more time. So I, I rank these according to can I do it and how long does it take to do it? And then I choose the best possible one. So remember my backboard is attached to those three points that can control where it goes. I do a thing called inverse kinematics, which is sounds way fancier than it actually is. It basically means figuring out how I need to move these individual actuators so the whole thing goes to where I want it to go. Oh, by the way, if you want to sound really cool, you call it IK. Yeah, I just threw a little bit of IK at the problem. No big deal, you know, it was nothing. So in this case, this one has to move forward this much, this one has to move forward that much. Once I have that, and I have just enough time to make that move, I yell out to the backboard, move here, and then it moves there really fast, and then hopefully sinks the shot. And that's really all there is to it. All that's left now to is, uh, uh, just give me a second here to make it rain. <laughs> I mean, that's not such a good idea. Before everyone asks, I'm still not accounting for spin, but I think I could if I felt like it. The frames per second from the camera, I think is high enough that I should be able to see the spin without aliasing, if that means anything to you. I just haven't gotten around to do it since I don't even know how to put spin on the ball. But like I said, I could. And for now, that's enough for me. If you like what you see, you should subscribe. I build stuff all the time and a lot of things are pretty cool. If you have something you think I should build, let me know in the comments. Maybe I will. I love good ideas. If you want more depth on this, also let me know. I really had a hard time cramming all of this in here and I left out a ton of details. And that's all I have for now. I'm out. Thanks.